All right. Hello, Mark. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, like I said, I'm sorry about yesterday. I understand we had no, a no, bit no, of. No, 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 no. It's cool. Don't worry about it. Yeah. I just want to say before we, before we uh, begin, I'm a huge fan. I've um, I go to the university. Uh, let me just tell you a bit about myself before we continue, just to give you a good uh, background. Sure. sure. I um, I go to the University of Arkansas here uh, in Fayetteville, which is a beautiful city. And um, I studied pre-med for biochemistry. Mm -hmm. And um, I stumbled across your channel while, you know, like you said, while um, digging down in the rabbit hole. You just kind of like look into different ideas and then different things start to pop up. And um, I watched the Flat Earth Clues and I thought it was fascinating. I mean, if I, if I, want, if I want to be honest with you, for me, it's um, you have a plausible argument, but um for me i feel like i feel like i'm busy and i feel like i feel like i i i have too much on my plate to sure. dig into the idea that th there's this much of a big thing going on right now in the right. world right. yeah but uh tell us about i want i want to start by getting to know you a little bit better sure. now i um my plan is for my sociology class is to create a slide um maybe 30, 40 PowerPoints, and uh, to have maybe a bit little clips just to give information about yourself. Right. But the right. whole idea behind this interview is um, to speak about uh, different ideologies, the fact that right. us on this globe, we can all have different opinions and learn to agree with each other. Right. And, um, you know, because I don't appreciate, because let's just say, Flat Earthers get hate, correct? Oh, lots. They, yeah. Yes. Now, now for me, I come from a Muslim background, and uh, you know, being a Muslim here in Arkansas, sometimes it can be a bit difficult because of the criticisms you tend to get. So I kind of understand how that feels. Yeah. And um, also, uh, I want to say something very interesting before we begin. Uh, after after learning about the Flat Earth. You know, I, I just asked something very simple. Just a few of my friends, I brought it up to them. And probably one out of every 30 believes that the earth is flat. And I was genuinely shocked by that. You know, I because you said it. You said it yourself. You said if you ask around, you know, you'd be surprised, like, the individual near you is, is in that sort of right, belief. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So first question is... Um, what is flat earth and what does it mean to you flat earth is the belief that we are not this tiny little rock flying through space that's covered with a thin sheen of water which is covered with a thin sheen of atmosphere that is flying in five different directions and five different velocities and that we mean nothing uh, we believe that we are living inside a planetarium, a terrarium, a snow globe, a structure with walls and a floor and a ceiling that was created by something, something much bigger and much older than us. Uh, again, you, you take your pick, advanced civilization or the divine, but really at that point you're just splitting hairs. And what it means to me is it's a message of hope. It, not only is it does it open minds because at a, you know if you can get your head around the whole flat earth concept then you can get your head around just about anything um but it gives people meaning it gives people purpose uh you aren't this insignificant little speck flying through the universe you were put here for a reason and that reason is part of your journey your adventure your story and flat earth is integral to that where it gives you the mechanisms and the means to explore the possibility that you are here with purpose. That's basically what it is. Understood. And um, some of the some of the information that you point out, I thought was very fascinating, um, especially the individual who was circumnavigating um, Antarctica. And I actually did read. I actually did um, view his interview. And um, I think it's interesting because a lot of the points you do bring up, once you put like under under a, a microscope, there's really it's really hard to shake it down because it seems like it's all there. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and and I think that's why a lot of people grab gravitate towards this. 
And um, I think it's unfortunate that many people say, you know, only uh, stupid individuals or uh, inexperienced individuals believe in flat earth. Because I think that, like you said, because of because in every single classroom, there's a globe there. Right. It makes it it makes it where, you know, it's the it's the American flag and the globe. It's really hard to differentiate. Right. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, there is no like with anything. Conditioning is a simple process. And that is you make a statement and you repeat it over and over and over and over. And it does not you don't even have to have the target to be engaged for it to sink in. So when you tell people for. 25 generations that it's a globe even though you do not have any photographic evidence of it you and people say you know people people feel bad it's like you know i couldn't have been tricked it's like no 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 you were born into the deception i mean it kind of like the matrix where it wasn't just you it was your father and your father's father going back way before your family before your tree family was, even a, was even a thing so, so that's it it, it's easy to do. Conditioning is not hard to to, to accomplish with anybody. And uh, sorry, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely you're doing great. And um, something, and uh, I I want to talk about the powers that shall not be named. This sure. is, um, and I got that quote from Patricia every time we watch. I watch the um, the hot, hot potatoes. potatoes show, yeah. Patricia. yeah, that always comes to mind. And um, I want to, th I, I, when, when that statement comes to mind, I can think of a few names. Let's just say the head executives of NASA, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. Right. Um, and I want to ask you about something um, very much new. Jeff Bezos, uh, the uh, uh, owner of Amazon, recently said that uh, his next plan is, is for the future is to start um, building ideas about creating a type of a type of uh, habitat right. outside the planet's orbit. Right. When you hear that type of thing, where because I'm because I think if if they know that this is all a, a scam, wouldn't they have a, a bit of a fear revealing these saying that these things will happen if it's not possible? I don't think with people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and uh, Sir Richard Branson from Virgin Galactic, I don't think you would need to tell them anything. Meaning they're billionaires, they billionaires get bored and they, they want to do lofty things. Some, some go into charities and some take hot air balloons and fly around mm -hmm. in them. Uh, in this case, it's just a stunt headline to get funding. So <clears throat> he's coming off a, a huge divorce and he's trying to reestablish himself in the, in the corporate world. So what better way than to just make a statement that you do not have to follow up on, which is, oh yeah, we're going to, we're going to make colonies outside of earth's orbit, or we're going to go to the moon. And all you have to do is do a mock-up space capsule, which looks amazing. And they like the capsule from 1969. And that's what you just go with. And the same thing with uh, Elon Musk, where it's like, oh yeah, we're going to send two tourists around the moon. Then he throws the Tesla image out there in the space yes. and everyone forgot about the moon missions. And he's like, oh yeah, Tesla in space, even though again, Patricia was, was very astute in pointing this out where it should have been the greatest marketing campaign of all time. And we never saw a single banner. We never saw a single television commercial. You could have milked that thing for everything that it was worth. It was perfect. It was flawless. It was in HD and it yeah. never ever happened. So do those guys need to know? No, they don't. Um, kind of like Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's better off having them act naturally. The powers who should not, should not be or the powers who should not be named uh, is something that I talked about during a National Geographic thing, which was it's one of the first rules of power, which is the first rule of power is the short version is uh, stay hidden. The longer version is never put yourself in a position where you can be overthrown. And by that, I mean the general public as weak as they are they the, the powers that be have always described the general public as a giant lumbering beast in that you don't want to get it angry you don't want to get mm -hmm. in its way and if it knows who you are you're in real trouble it is the curse of being the highest level of power which is when you're at the highest level of power and think about it just from your standpoint you it's a it's a blessing and a curse you can't be famous and be able to be the puppet master at the same time because yeah. if they know who you are 
and you have remember the the overthrown thing and they want to overthrow you you can't overthrow uh, give you the short version you can't overthrow someone or have a coup if you don't know who they are mm -hmm. meaning you don't give them a target and so kings and presidents and and uh, um, dictators and all these are though they can be replaced because remember, the public, as long as they have the illusion of choice, which is why even in the United States, we have the Democrats and the Republicans. And you either vote for a Democrat or Republican. And people identify themselves based on their voting. It's like, well, I, you know, the country's going to hell. Well, I didn't vote Democrat this year. And it's like, really? Because you think you have an yeah. impact uh, on this. It's the illusion of, of, of some sort of influence, even as small as it might be on, on the culture. Which is why I love telling people that, you know, because I say I've never voted in my life. And they go, why? I go, because I'm not a billionaire. That's why. And they say, what do you mean? I go, well, if you have a billion dollars, you are going to throw money at some political party. Which one do you throw it at? Democrats or Republican? It's a trick question. You throw it at both. Because they don't care. Yeah. There's no loyalty there. The Democrats don't care if you wrote a million dollar check to the Republicans and vice versa. But yeah. if you write a million dollar check or five million, you actually get to influence a few things, at least the public persona. Now, you may not be able to influence total culture. I mean, come on, come on. President Trump, he's not the most powerful man in the world. He's, he's just a figurehead. That's all he's Correct. there for. So if something goes wrong, that's why he's, his name is in the news every single day. It's like if the country's doing great. Well, it's Trump's, you know, Trump did it. If tr country, yeah. the country's doing terrible, Trump did it. So anyway, sorry, I ramble. No, you're a hundred percent right. And um, this next topic, uh, because really, I want to, because the, the the issue is, I have a conflict of interest. I I have questions of my own that I want to sidetrack, and then I have questions for this project. Sure. And it's it's hard to it's hard to work between the two of them because uh, uh, for me, this is this is. Uh, a decided work piece that I'm going to work on all summer long, but then it's also a kind of interest, a fascination for me. But okay, let's talk about you and your position in Flat Earth. Now, I understand that you do not claim that you are the founder of Flat Earth, but that you are the one who opens the door, the one who points at the door and kind of gathers these individuals who have these same ideas and filter them into one type of of you know under one you you make things make sense right right, right. you 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 add some numbers together you give some ideas and you give the general perspective of what is the flat earth right uh, if flat earth is a university then i would be the freshman recruiter i would be the tour guide mm -hmm. I'm the one that, that walks around the outs walks you through campus and says, all right, well, yes. over here we're attacking NASA. Over here we got street activism. Over here we got uh, water experiments, land experiments, balloon experiments, and so on and so on. Over here we got a music department and so on and so on. And by the time I'm done, I just kind of let you go and say, all right, have fun with it. Choose yeah. whatever you want. Uh, I do not care if you if you end up even subscribing to my channel or listening to me. Uh, in fact, what I try to tell people, because there's a lot of people that, you know, that still don't trust me. And I say, do you still believe in flat earth? I go, they go, yeah. And I go, then I don't care. Go leave me alone. Exactly. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, there's a, nobody invented flat earth. Flat earth has been around forever. Flat earth was forever. here before the globe. And in fact, flat earth was the dominant species in the scientific, well, we'll call it scientific community for a long, long time. And it was really, it was only 500 years ago that the globe took over and so no i i didn't invent it i just uh, you know i do my part and for whatever reason i get people that, that want to talk to me about it and uh, i'm i'm grateful for it and again on tour this year so who, who go figure yes and now as bashful as the Logan Paul documentary was and um, as screwed as the documentary on Netflix was, because I've seen everything really that involves Flat Earth. Oh. I understand. Yeah, I understand that, uh, you know, something, you know, like Logan Paul used it as a movie. He, uh, right. he had actors, um, um, you know, he cut out clips to make uh, Robbie Davidson seem crazy right. regarding the whole penguin idea. But... The, but even beyond this point, when people do look at these types of things, at least a bit of a spark goes into the head and they're like, OK, well, this is weird. I want to see what this is. Yeah. And so my question to you is once you because 
like going going by what I've seen because I I've, I've been uh, I've been watching you for maybe about a period of six six and a half months, yeah. and so slowly I can see the um, that more eyes are open that this is beyond Washington this is beyond the United States now yeah. it's growing bigger, you know I was um I was really happy for the community when you had uh, you know individuals from Australia and from from different countries yeah. Um, yeah. But when you have these, when you have all these individuals join, you start to have different figureheads that propose different ideas. True. Now I understand that flat Earth is is flat Earth leaves things to to prediction because you don't know what's beyond the wall. You don't know who created. Now, if I were to be a flat earther, I would believe that God created the wall. And um, for that point, I would believe you're correct when you say that flat earth makes religion easier. Because like you said, um, DeGrasse Tyson kind of bashes the the religious community um, to the point where he makes us seem like, you know, we're totally backwards for believing that, that a God, you know. Uh, so that's why that I have just like you have a bias against him. I do as well. But uh, to to move it along and ask my question, when uh, when you have all these groups join in and then there's um, flat Earth becomes bigger, but it starts to evolve into these different concepts. Right. Is that what you want, or do you want it? Because I feel like if it was a more unitary view, like we all we all go by one model, it would make you more firm in the eyes of the public. <laughs> well. It's not what I want, it's what would naturally happen anyway. So in any university, I mean, you've got divisions in university. There's all sorts of departments which with compete each other and with compete with each other and they have uh, differences of opinions, but at the end of the day, they're still in the same university. So yeah. when it comes to flat earth and people coming up with new ideas and new concepts, look, first off, I can't shoot down any of them because <laughs> I'm into flat earth. You know, that's why I always start my day. How can I even begin? Like, like when I was into flat earth a year, when someone brought up to me the, the, the whole point of the moonlight being cold and I, my knee, knee jerk reaction is like, come on. What? And you remember I'm in flat earth and I'm saying that. And then all of a yeah. sudden I start looking into it. So now I can't shoot down any theories. What I try to tell people is you don't have to worry about the division and the different views and the fact that our model seems to be somewhat ethereal and not everybody agrees on it because it is – lost my train of thought there for a second. It is – at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because it if it brings in, if it brings in more people – and they're all against science at the end. And my, not, I'm, we're not talking about you know, rabid anti-science. It's okay. Um, I've, I've tried to say... Oh boy, I've, I absolutely just lost my train of thought just then. What was the initial question no. again? It was, no, no, oh, you're it was, fine. People, it was pre people bringing in other models. Which is, again, it's fine. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what I was going to say. Which is, what resonates? Remember, everything about Flat Earth right now is content-driven. Meaning you go out, you have a brand new YouTube channel, you want to make something in Flat Earth, you, you mix a series of videos. It either resonates with people or it doesn't. And if and people will share it. I mean, Flat Earth is really open about that. If people find a really cool Flat Earth video and they think that people's like, oh yeah, they'll let me share it. That video goes all over the place. I mean, the, the no trees on Flat Earth, when that came out a couple of years ago, that resonated mm -hmm. quite a bit. It eventually yes. died down, but the concept was interesting. So some things stick and some things don't. And not to use a, too much of a cliche, but the cream always rises to the top. So yes. it, everybody that's been doing the flat earth, if it rubs people the wrong way, if it's negative in any way, shape or form, it doesn't get that much traction. There are people out there that have big chat. Remember, I'm, not, I'm barely in the top 10 when it comes to flat earth channels in terms of subscribers. And yet there's people out there that make a lot more videos and get a lot more hits but it only really resonates in a certain way. So it's okay. I, I don't mind that. Uh, having a clear, concise model doesn't exactly help us right now because people like the, because we're still figuring it out. You know, we've only yeah. been doing it four years. So people trying to nail down certain aspects, it's like, okay, fine. We'll use the AE map as a base. That's about as far as anyone's willing to go. And, and it's, even then it's like, oh, 70% maybe believe in a dome and 30% don't. 
And then the rest is just wide open, which lets people it lets people run with concepts. Because remember, if it's if it's too rigid, uh, remember we don't have a Bible or, or robes or chanting or anything. So if it's too rigid, people don't know what to do. They don't they can't express themselves. Yeah. And so the, it's fine. I, I have no problem with that whatsoever. And so far it's panned out to that degree. Every conference, every email, every phone call I get is somebody thinking outside of the box, thinking, it's yes. like, okay, what about this? I hear that more than just about anything. In addition, the, the top two questions are normally they are from the, the counter side is, okay, how does this work? And what about, what about this? And either what about this in terms of they don't understand how this works or what about this in have you thought of this before? And so yeah. anyway, sorry, long, long answer short. I'm perfectly OK with it. OK. And, um, you know, uh, when I when I go volunteering at the hospital, I always try to get opinions because uh, my mind kind of uh, once it comes to, um, you know, I'm doing pre-med and my mother always tells me. Uh, you know, for, for a biochemistry major, you're awfully doing a lot of things because I love learning about music. I love learning about philosophy. I love learning about religions. And then Flat Earth, I found interesting. Right. So I always ask people uh, at uh, people around me. And the most common question they say is, well, you know, Flat Earthers tend to be um, anti-science. And what, I, what my response is from your explanations is that Flat Earth isn't anti-science. Flat Earth if you if you if you show them if you for your example if you light a stove and put a pot of water on it and the water boils at a certain temperature right. we don't we don't doubt that because that's that's visible we can right. test it we can see it but once it comes to telling me that gravity is something that exists then it's hard for me to believe it um, and so you know some people have these sort of um, some there's a lot of stereotypes once it comes to flat earth. Right. And I always love to compare it to Islam because, you know, living here, um, I've built a community of Muslims at the university and we go and have talks, open talks with the Christian community. Right. And um, I guess that's why I, I got more of an attachment to Flat Earth. But I want to ask you, so where do you, where do you see, because if we're being honest, you know, you're, you're kind of on the rise once it comes to to introducing something that people are finding fascinating where do you think this will go in the next 5 years oh i think i think we'll have a complete world change within the next 5 years and that may sound delusional uh, on the surface but what i have seen in the first 4 years that we've been doing this has been uh, has, has exceeded my expectations. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example, and you probably heard me talk about the numbers, which was, you know, when we started doing this, the relevant search results in YouTube was about 50,000, um, and that's not necessarily, yes. necessarily videos, but all related. And that number kept going up and up to where we were blowing past mainstream topics. And I had predicted in 2018 that we would eventually catch Donald Trump by the end of the year. Mm. And when he and and all of a sudden it was the middle of the summer and we were at 20.9 million and he was at 20.8, six months even ahead of, of my estimates, which was uh, I, generous at best. And then they tore the score, scoreboard down after that. Yes. They, they just ripped it down. I'm going and people say, yes. well, and I said, that's because of us. And they, and they figure, oh, you're delusional. I'm going, no, no, I'm not. I would have said that a couple of years ago, not now. Yes. The the things that are doing now are, are I mean, there are Senate subcommittee hitting, hearings that are already bringing up our name, which is, which is really, really weird. So move that forward five years from now. I mean, we're in, we're on tour this year. We've got so many, we've got exponentially more conferences than we did last year, this year, uh, for no apparent reason. So what happens in, you know, in 2020, I, I, what I'd like to happen is the hundredth monkey effect. And I know there are scientists that will disagree and say, oh, that's a myth. It's not real. It's like, no, of course it's, we didn't make it up. You guys are the ones that came up with the hundredth monkey effect. And it sounds like, it sounds like a, a software update to me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm fond of saying that God is a programmer and people say, well, you're diminishing God. I'm going, no, we didn't invent code. We didn't invent yeah. anything. There's nothing new under the sun. God invented it all. So yes. uh, God being a programmer is not that much of a stretch. So when the, if the hundredth monkey effect hits people, and it won't hit it exactly like it does with other species, uh, then all of a sudden 
you'll have this tipping point, which I love talking about, where uh, it is much more acceptable to believe in the old model than the new model. Because yes. it's, and, and I've said several times why the reason why it's going to take off. And honestly, in the next five years, I don't even know. I don't even know if I can know. I can predict the next three. Um, but the reason why it's spread so fast, it's on the rise is because now flat earth has a model as ethereal as it is. It is easier to understand than the globe. Yes. And that is a really powerful motivator for the general population. Remember, it's called the lowest common denominator for a reason. And when the average person on the street, if you have to give them a choice and it's like, oh yeah, flat earth model, that's easy to understand. I'm going with that. That's really, really powerful. Yeah. And which is why, you know, the religious communities are seeing an uptick in people that are believing in, in God again, because it, anyone that was on the fence, it's like, well, if it is a flat earth, I mean, seriously, it's one of the default states. If it is a flat enclosed system, then it had to have been created. Yes. And at that point, it is tough to be an atheist. I mean, if you're an atheist, you've got to agree at the very least that it was an advanced civilization that's much, much older than us. And yes. if you want to take the easier route, well, then it's the divine. So there correct. You. And um, what um, following your um, just just watching you grow and um, and watching Flat Earth evolve. Yeah. I always look back and think that, you know, you you personally did an amazing job uh, nurturing the idea because I remember when uh, I remember I, I watched some tough because I love watching your debates, yeah. but some debates were just so disrespectful like once once they came to questioning and they were so rough and angry and it's like you know you can't be angry at a man just because he believes in something if he has his points you know but yeah I, some of those interviews did upset me and i feel like you did such a great job because you've always stayed the same same tone you've you you know once it comes to the idea you never say that oh all atheists are wrong because the because the flat earth had a creator no you keep it open you say if you want to believe that and yeah. so that's what i think is amazing well thank you um thank you for saying that it's much appreciated i again you you've probably heard me say it which is i can't get mad at them because it's be hypocritical i you know i was them on the other and rob skiba was the first one to pick up on that where it's true you if you if you're in it deep enough whoever's coming at you I, you once you get the whole empathy thing going where you're looking at him, it's like well you don't even know why you're mad you're not mad at me yeah. we have no history you're mad at the idea which is fine you can be mad at the idea because i was too and i know everyone a lot of people in the community their, their enthusiasm is so high they don't like hearing it but at the same time it's it is the one big drawback of being in flat earth which is you forget what it took to get you there the the pain the pain and suffering that you know the, at the end of the tunnel you finally reach at the end and all of a sudden you look back and that tunnel's not even there anymore yeah and that's what people forget it's like it's like how long did it take you to get th through flat earth and most people say you know two weeks to four weeks or something like that and i go and you want to try to convince somebody in an hour how's that going to happen you know you you understand that if the if, when somebody somebody came to you at some point and you yelled at them and and i was lucky enough i was alone in boulder colorado and so i didn't have to i didn't have to bounce this off of anybody i was just yelling at myself i mean i'm not yeah. kidding you i was just like just screaming at the computer going there is no way there is no way this could be happening so um yeah when it comes to debates there are some people it, it, a, a lot of it comes down to the producers and the hosts uh what angle they want to take it comes down to the audience which is and, and which is why i will never say this on to them on air but i don't care about the host i i don't care who's asking me the questions i care about the listeners so yeah. as long as he's coming at me as long as he's engaging me with whatever yeah. it is that's great you're asking me questions i'm going to give you the answers and if you want to make fun it's like well that's ridiculous that's stupid blah blah it's fine because your listeners there's going to be a bunch of those listeners that are going to be like yeah you know what that's not bad because people always defend the same they attack differently but they defend the same and so if i yeah. came back and and really got angry at people and said well i think you're being insulting and i think we should I, there was only one time that i think i lost my cool and even then most people didn't see it which was i threatened to leave an interview 
because uh, the guy was making accusations and he hadn't even watched the clues. And yeah. and I had said I and I said, well, don't you think you should have actually watched the clues before you come after me? And he goes, well, I don't have to. They're stupid. They're ridiculous. I'm going, well, OK, then we shouldn't be talking. And, exactly. So. And uh, and I would one hundred and, and see, it's 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 a bit it, it's it, it feels like they're already setting you up for a trap when they invite you to an interview, yeah. but they haven't done the research. It's like this man that you can see that he has experience and he has influence in this community. At least research his points, yeah. so that so that when he comes on, he's able to give his full opinion, and yeah. you're able to at least say, okay, I I remember you preface this in this area, right? And um, I remember when I was listening to your interviews, you would always come back to Flat Earth Clues or the book, and right. then and so I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to go back and go through all of that, and then come back to these interviews so I can piece it together. Right. But but again. Um, you, you know, you and Patricia Steer brought brought up something important and very interesting. Once, it, because let's just say, even if somebody doesn't believe in flat Earth, will not believe in flat Earth, right. flat Earth has a bunch of truths. Once it comes to how the world and how power is structured and how big companies are able to, like the Tesla launch, where the car, you know, you had a great point where you said the car was perfectly fine in, in the middle of the vacuum of space. Right. You know, the, the windows didn't shatter, the, the, the engine didn't combust. The, and, and, you know, the whole losing the technology to go to the moon, it's just like, how could you lose something so fundamental to U.S. history? Right. You know, you have the Civil War, you have World War II, and you have the moon landing. So, um, yeah, no technology has ever gone backwards ever. Uh, a perfect example would be, and I know you're too young, but eight track tapes before, before cassettes, they, we had something called eight track tapes, which were kind of like giant, uh, video game cartridges, which just had music on them. Yeah. And we can still make those now. That's the difference. We can make those anytime we want. We can make, we can reverse engineer and make any of the old technology we've ever made with the exception of NASA technology. NASA says, oh, no, we can't we can't make that anymore. It's like, what are you talking about? We are a civilization that moves forward with technology and science. Yeah. And oh, but, but I have to throw this in real quick. It's not that Flat Earth is uh, the community is against science. Uh, I'll use the Robbie Davidson line. Uh, we're against scientism, which is, again, if you want to you want to tell me what science is, that's fine. You know, test, observe, repeat. But if you start making claims on things that we cannot test, observe and repeat. Yes. Well, and then you put your stamp on it and, you know, like, OK, let's talk about it. like there was a perfect example, a headline I watched or I looked at today where they were um, or it was it was a headline. I think it was a headline. They were talking to a dinosaur expert asking him about different, I think, movie dinosaurs and having him his opinion. It's like a dinosaur expert. Well, that's an interesting concept, considering you didn't ever see any dinosaurs. No one ever in the history of our civilization has ever seen dinosaurs. Yeah. And we, the best we've got are fossils, and the carbon dating on them is absolutely in question. And yet you're going to say, tell us everything that ever happened about dinosaurs. And not only that, you're going to physically call yourself a dinosaur expert. Well, exactly, Mark. That's a great point. And, um, and you know, I have I have my own doubts about the whole idea of the the fossils and the carbon dating. But what's interesting is that for 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 decades, you know, scientists have put a picture on dinosaurs that you know they look like <laughs> reptiles, and uh, right. you know, the, but now they're coming out and saying that no, most dinosaurs had feathers. Then it's like, well, then if if you make because you know they they gather these bones because you can tell what the bones look like they put it together but then they add the flesh and then they add their own ideas of color right, and then, color yeah so it's like are you telling me that three decades of looking at a dinosaur and now we're supposed to believe that all of them had feathers i mean you know and i think that's that's where science made a huge flaw yeah. in it yeah. because science is always saying well, we go by fact and we go by test and trial the, but i feel like the, yeah, the, I feel like that. The, the great line that I always use, that I always come back to, which is the George Orwell line, where he was talking about how people believe anything that science tells them. Basically, anything that the lab coats tell them, the average person on the street says, well, they've got a degree or they've got, they're definitely more intelligent than us. And when he was talking about uh, the shape of the world, something very, very basic, and, and you, you heard me say this, where 
he said that uh, you ask the average person on the street how they know the earth is a globe and immediately they go well we know it's known it's a fact it's a given and then you say really how exactly is it a fact or a given and then they start got, getting angry now the reason they got angry when he was asking that that question was because it was 1946 and that was 12 years before nasa was even founded so how did everybody in the world know in 1946 that it was a globe they didn't mm -hmm. they were told this for 20 generations and if you're yes. told something, yes, absolutely it's known because you, I mean, you could have been sitting around a fire with your great grandfather and it's like, oh yeah, my father told me it was a globe. And it's like, yeah. you just, it's, it's passed down not to steal from Lord of the Rings, but, uh, you know, myth into legend. And mm. that's, that's really what it became. And anyway, sorry, go on. Now, Mark, the the next point I might have a bit of trouble trying to explain, but I feel like it's pretty important because as a constant viewer and observer of um, the Flat Earth community and specifically the, the content that you go through, mm -hmm. I try to um, give a lot of my uh, college friends, uh, you know, some of the ideas and then send them your videos. You know, I'm like, well, go research Mark Sarge and see what he has to say, yeah. you know, because, because, uh, really if it, it, like, like, let's just say SciShow, like, um, and just to sidetrack just a bit when, uh, when Neil deGrasse Tyson tried to explain flat earth and debunk it, right. he, he, he did not, he, he didn't say what most flat earthers believe because he told, he was telling the viewers that flat earth believes that You've got the sun and all the planets are circular and then there's just a flat piece yeah, the, in the, the universe. The, the cracker world in the solar system, yeah. Yeah, and I feel like that was because I watched that and I know your content and, and I'm like, that's unfair because you're, you're giving the view that's like the, at least 80% of the, the, the because we, we all believe that there might be a dome and that there's an outside structure, but to say that, you know, because that all the, because he's trying to make you look wrong by saying that the planets are all circular but we just believe that the earth is flat and everything else is just the way it's supposed to be right 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 yeah but uh getting back to on my point okay so i have to dive into because you said to get into flat earth you you have to have crossed other conspiracies you said that most flat earthers tend to be conspiracy theorists right. and um i can understand that but let's talk about the more controversial um the more controversial uh, uh conspiracies that are harder to swallow for the public mm -hmm. now first thing two things that come to mind would probably have to be vaccinations yep. and the sandy hook shootings yep. now i watched your uh now when i gave my um when i gave your videos to my friends and they started searching it they they automatically their brain automatically shut off and they were not willing to they were not willing to dig more because they say, okay, this, uh, this individual thinks that Sandy Hook is fake. Right. I can't, I can't. And I've, and like I said, because, because I've watched you for so long, I understand the reasoning and I think it's plausible. Like right. I always go back to it and say that the reasoning is definitely plausible. You, you talked about the video. You've also talked about the individual who was interviewed on camera, but do you think that these, cons do you think that these conspiracy theories might be better off unstated maybe for the growth of because well, i feel like <laughs> it's it's you're not going to be able to un un you can't remove them from history unfortunately and there are some conspiracies that tug on the heartstrings more than others uh and let's let's face it there's a lot of hypocrisy when it comes to media and conspiracies there i mean there are massive conspiracies that were publicly done i mean you gotta remember the definition of conspiracy alone where three or more people conspire to hide something from somebody else you know whether you know you went out with your buddy's car and you put a dent in it and you know everyone that was in the car it's like okay we're not telling them okay or, or yeah. we'll just, it's like it just happened in a parking lot while we were there but things, I'll, I'll give you two quick ones, for example. Um, let, let's like put it up, put, put them up against like Sandy Hook. The reason why Sandy Hook did as well as it did in the media is because it tugged on the heartstrings. It was about kids, grade schoolers, right? But in the grand scheme of things, compared to very public conspiracies, not, not uh, like, like Enron, I don't know if that name mm. ever rings a bell with you. I mean, Enron yeah. was so devastating financially to so many people that the United States government had to rewrite some of its corporate tax laws 
just so that no one would ever do that again. And if they did, they would go to jail forever. I mean, the, it, yeah. the reason why Enron uh, uh, got so huge is because they found a loophole. So, okay. So, uh, and, and then let's use um, another one. I, I put it this challenge to anybody. Compare Sandy Hook to uh, Lance Armstrong. You're saying, okay, well, uh, you know, nobody died with Lance Armstrong. I'm going, yeah, but he absolutely crushed the uh, the entire cycling world. And you're saying, well, that's just sports. Like, no, no, no. You know how many millions and millions of dollars he lied for seven years to the can mm -hmm. to every camera and said, I'm not doping, I'm not doping, I'm not doping, right? Until they yeah. absolutely had him dead to rights, and it's like, oh yeah, I was lying the entire time. And, wow. and they stripped yes. him of all his titles, and now he lives in utter disgrace. But the bigger picture there was that he just devastated the cycling world. It's like, well, yeah, but nobody died. You can't put a price on human life. You absolutely can put a price on human life. We do it in the military all the time. Yeah. Um, to answer your to, to answer the Sandy Hook thing, look, Sandy Hook's going to come up from time to time because people are out there. I mean, look, I'm not shy about saying it. And what's interesting is that anybody ever interviews me and I, for, I, I do it in two stages. They say, hey, would you like to talk about Sandy Hook or vaccinations? And we won't even bring up vaccinations right now. Um, and I'll say, sure, but just remember, you asked me. I didn't, yeah. I didn't offer it. I will not offer up any other conspiracies unless you ask me. And then if you yes. ask me, it was weird because I will give them my answer on the Sandy Hook thing and you probably heard it, me say it and, I, and they never use it. They never use the sound bites because it is too yeah. obvious and they know full well. I mean, any media company can look it up, which is like, look, 10 second video clip. Find me a 10 second video clip of a child being carried out of that school. 10 seconds. Yeah. I will PayPal you a thousand dollars right here and now. It does not exist, but it has to exist because the traffic copters got there immediately and they stayed there with a full tank of gas and just hovered and hovered and hovered. Nobody ever came out of that school. It's because the school was closed. It had been closed for three years. And, yeah. and sorry, let's throw in the vaccinations. Uh, and that is the short version of vaccinations, which no one sound bite will, no one will use a sound bite of is that the mob Remember, remember what I said about the, the, the general population is like a lumbering beast. The mob wants blood. If there's a problem, they want answers. They don't care what your excuse is. You've got to give them something. So yeah. if, if it's, again, if it's not the air, it's not the water, and it's not the food that's causing this, because those are all regional things, you can't, as a scientist, go to the population and say, and when they ask you, hey, why is our autism rate gone up 100,000%, right? You can't just shrug your shoulders and say, I have no idea. They won't take that. They won't, they'll be like, no, 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 we need a subject. I mean, there's a reason why lynch mobs happened. It wasn't just, yeah. a, you know, the lynch mobs happened because the people wanted a suspect. And usually, you know, the mob mentality, they would find a suspect and they would kill them. And a lot of times, erroneously. But uh, in this case, look, I, I, I like it. Uh, you know, uh, use a crime uh, analogy. I like Big Pharma as the suspect. They're the leading suspect right now. If you find me better, I will go with it. So no, it doesn't. It doesn't hurt us if you know how to answer this stuff. Unfortunately, let me put a rider on this. Unfortunately, the conspiracy world generally doesn't know when to shut up. So when they bring up you, you get somebody talking about vaccine vaccinations or uh, Sandy Hook. Yeah. Generally, they'll be like, "Oh, wow, well, we're at it. Let's talk about 9/11. Let's talk about Boston bombing and JFK yeah. and all this." And they'll just fly. Yeah with it um i even had a um i had a reporter and i don't say it anymore which when i said that uh the russians helped us uh when 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 it came to um operation deep freeze and the antarctic treaty and stuff you know the russians were in on it as well i go look russians russia's never been our, had never been our enemy and she just stopped right then and there and no she didn't use it but she was really curious she's like what do you mean never been i'm going and, and I tried to be gentle with her. It's like, look, just because you guys keep reporting that the Soviet Union and us, we've been, you know, these bitter rivals forever, yeah. you know, doesn't mean that it's true. We've never squared off. Don't you think that's a little strange? We've never gone to war with the Soviet Union. We've, we've only been like standing on street corners, just eyeballing each other. No. no. Anyway, yeah. I'm sorry. And, and you're definitely right once it comes to NASA as being the head figure piece and, um, I used to live in Houston, which was like about four minutes, four or five minutes drive from NASA headquarters. Oh, I've been there. And 
Yeah, and they've kind of turned it into like a museum slash Disneyland. Park. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and and Mark, it's a bit embarrassing to say the least that you know this um, this huge huge enterprise has become this type of. Uh, oh, I walked through you know, it. I I walked through it and with Patricia and we were they didn't use that much footage in the documentary on it when yeah. we were walking around it, but it felt like an aged amusement park from like the early 80s where everything yeah. was worn there was stuff that was broken i mean yes. for example the, the green the famous green button scene where i you supposedly didn't hit the green button it's like are you kidding yeah. everything was broken at that point it was like hitting the green button it's like well it's not working maybe they got a touch screen override yeah. and you know but all they had to do was remove the green button out of that shot and it's like oh mark missed the green button he must miss the globe too it's like ah oh, super funny I feel like people underestimate you, Mark. Like, um, okay, let's talk about. I found this really funny because I knew you way before I knew Jake Paul, but right. I had a, I had a kind Logan of Paul. understanding of Logan Paul. Mm. I had a sort of understanding about him. So I watched his video where he where he after the documentary he kind of breaks down what happened, and I found it really funny because he talks about you for a second. Yep. He says, "Yep, right." He he was on to us and he left. Yep. And I was like, "That's Mark Sargent," because Mark Sargent can see. You know, he can see if, you know, he, he can see the intentions from the person that comes in. You know, if you're coming with a bunch of high school or college boys and, and you're making quite a ruckus. In this you know, case, I, I was vindicated and I was happy about that, but I was more yeah. frustrated because you didn't see what happened the night before, which was I was sitting with a bunch of the speakers. And I'm trying to tell them, I'm trying to convey to them, I was like, look, I know this guy. He is trouble. He, th he's only here for nefarious purposes. And nobody knew who he was. And I was like, oh, you're killing me. So I had to more or less uh, sacrifice myself for the team because I couldn't let him. I, if he was going to punk us, he couldn't punk everybody because then yeah. the headlines would have read Logan Paul punks all of Flat Earth, which he did not. Yeah. Thank God. Um, but yeah. And, and but yes, I saw that part, too where he mentioned me by name and it was like, it was good. Yeah. I knew exactly what he was talking about. Cause he was listening to a podcast. I went immediately back to Seattle and did a podcast that night and trying to explain to people why. And he listened to it and, yeah. and he, well, anyone that's punking anybody always is paranoid about getting caught. And so yes. he thought it's like, Oh crap, the jigs up. I, we're going to get, we're going to get pinched for sure. And so yeah. that's when, and, and I was partially responsible for that. So it's like, yeah, so he left the hotel, but I think he was looking for an excuse. He was like, I think he was already too nervous because I mean, he, he called it his greatest punk of all time because he's walking around and, you know, saying, Oh, I might be a flat earther. And it's like, no, no, you're not. He should have actually, he but, would have been better off if he would have been still in flat earth, honestly. Yes, but you were 100% right when you said he had a golden opportunity, and we're glad he didn't use it. But when he was on that stage, oh. you know, he had he had a golden opportunity to make the the whole community, you know, you know, seem like complete. He like, could have people. Any yeah. any comedian worth his salt, and Logan's not that; he's just an internet personality. Uh, yeah. Any any comedian worth his salt would have dug in and and talked as long as that microphone had a had power to it. And, yeah, and, and he could have. He could have been like, "You guys are idiots. You guys, are, you know." He yeah. could have gone off on a jag, but that's not him. He chickened out. He realized he exactly. Was he was too scared. Yeah, he was outnumbered by a huge amount. Even with his posse, he was outnumbered. Uh, but there are other comedians that. I mean, he did us a favor in some ways because other comedians now will not be allowed anywhere near a podium. Uh, because it'd be like, sorry, Conan O'Brien or Jimmy Fallon or yeah. uh, any any late night show. They'd be like, uh, "Sorry, you can't, you can't go on stage. You want to interview people? That's fine." Uh, so yeah, he had a great opportunity to to go for broke and really turn it into something special, and he chickened out. So that's fine. I'm 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 glad. Yeah, and uh, one of my uh, personal favorite interviews would have to be the one with Viva Fry. I uh, mm -hmm. I felt like, yeah, I, I felt like Viva Fry was one of those very very tough, critical, uh, you know, lawyer esque personalities well, lawyer esque i mean he was a full-blown lawyer and that yes. was the thing where he told me ahead of time he goes i don't want any context i'm gonna interview you like i'm cross-examining you on uh, um uh on the podium on the po no it's called on the um oh my god how can i not forget i remember this legal term i'm just slipping today anyway it doesn't matter like that's what he wanted me to do he wanted to cross-examine me and 
uh, when we got into it, and he didn't want to turn it into nuts. I mean, you heard it. He didn't want to turn it into nuts and bolts, but after a while, he couldn't help himself. Yeah, and he was uh, he was uh, go going in a circle because I noticed the circle continued to spin around and around, right. and he just had to stop because he was like, because you know, as much as he was launching at you right. you launched at him equally right. and and a lot of what you said that's why i think um once it comes to flat earth even though you're too humble to say it I, in my opinion i feel like you're uh you're the figurehead of flat earth mm. because you don't you don't go off of just speculation you kind of give an understanding you make you make the audience question things that regularly they wouldn't question right and so yeah, you did. You did very uh, perfect. And last, uh, and some of the last questions here. Sure. Um, and j just let me know if, because I understand that you've been interviewing no, and no, doing you're things fine. all day. You're fine. You're fine. Let's do it. Yes. And so, uh, I uh, through through this, I can see that more and more, you know, th throughout the day. And you said that you've committed most of your life to this now. Yeah. Now this flat Earth is what you are. Okay. Does that does that warn you? over 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 the period of time do you, because I, I i see that you're always proactive with emails you're the first you know uh person that i see on youtube that's replying as fast as you do and yeah. uh, interviewing calling so how how does that how, how has that affected your your psyche at this point like um going forward especially when you know this will get bigger uh more of an obligation than anything else and grateful that uh it sounds horrible probably but grateful that i never got married or had kids uh, yeah. because that would have really gotten in the way uh, of doing this whatever for whatever reason i am supposed to be doing i doing what i'm doing right now uh everything has been unsolicited everything has come to me i have had to do almost no effort reaching out at all and it's almost like that was the the kind of the instructions given to me uh when i got into this was like just keep just say yes to everything and it'll be fine and so as far as my psyche is concerned man i don't know um i i'm open-minded enough to where i'm just kind of rolling with it so yeah. i just try not to let anything surprise me I don't get starstruck necessarily. So, you know, hearing about other people and, and running into people that are that are higher level that, that don't want to come out of the closet. I don't see them as celebrities. You know, I don't see them as I see them as can they help the cause or can they not? Or, or mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I just about everybody can help the cause. It's just to what degree. Yes. Um, and then really just kind of getting up in the morning and realizing that people want, you know, their emails answered and their phone calls answered and uh, just trying to reach as many people as I can. And staying humble is is not as hard as you might think because the very topic itself humbles you. Meaning you, you, you think, you oh, yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, I got this interview and this interview, but it's about flat earth. So they're going into it. You know, you got to go in really cautiously. And so when I go in, I almost have no expectations whatsoever. I just feel the person out that I'm talking to and saying, OK, if he's attacking, is he doing it for the audience? Is he doing it for his mm -hmm. his membership? Is he doing it for his producers or yeah. is he gen or is it a personal thing? Like he's got a family member in aerospace, something like yeah. that. Uh, so. It's it's a mixed bag. I, I every time I say I'm not going to be surprised, I usually am. So like you know, heading heading off to Canada tomorrow for a conference that wasn't even really supposed to happen. We canceled the Toronto conference because Robbie was too busy doing other things, and as soon as he canceled it, Calgary came in and said, "Oh yeah, we'll do it." It's like okay. Wow. So don't know, don't know what, what else to tell you there. Just again, trying to stay humble and moving forward. And uh, have you ever thought about, because I know that you always go to conferences, yeah. have you ever thought about uh, expanding your, expanding uh, your, because I know that, like you said, you're the freshman recruiter. Have you ever thought about uh, expanding to the point where you, you run conferences or um, you create this sort of committee where uh, it's, it, in the larger scheme of things, it's, uh, it makes it more official. Your opinion is, is more concrete well, uh, in the community. Here's the problem with that. There are so many new people getting into it every m month and new players coming in and other people's kind of falling off. 
yeah that getting some sort of board you know like a like a board of directors type thing it's really tough to do and then you're dealing with a lot of egos personally and that is and it's like who's to say you know who who gets the the, the top board member positions is it based on subscribers is it based on interviews? Is it based on money you made? Or did somebody get a TV deal? Did somebody get, you know, who was in the documentary? Who wasn't in the mm -hmm. documentary? Um, it, so for the most part, I don't have to worry about, well, okay, first, let, the first part of your question is, as far as conferences go, those take a lot of effort to produce. Yes. A lot of effort. You've got to know your stuff. And if you're in a big yeah. conference, I mean, you're, it's, it's a fully committed thing. And there's, quite a bit of money involved too. So mm. I'm not, for me, look, my role is what my role is, which is I get yeah. people in and I, I'm perfectly fine with that. I don't mind being the tour guide or the freshman recruiter because, and, and watching people come in and say, oh yeah, you were the first guy that I listened to in Flat Earth. And then I went on and now I listen to these guys, which is great. Yeah. Fantastic. Good, good for you. Uh, I, I, I don't get hurt by that. Uh, I mean, come on. It's, why am I doing this at all? How how is this even happening? You, I, I, yeah. I'm still in some sort of. You asked about my psyche earlier. How is this even possible? From a logistic standpoint, I was I knew that we had something really great going on when I watched the documentary go through its process. And by that, you probably heard me say that like just the the first film festival we we got into, which was Toronto, yes. three thousand applied. 100 made it and out of those 100 we were and, and that was the same every freaking festival we went to we got in and we were always in the top 10 now we won very few awards because of the topic the topic is just yeah. too weird to win awards but people always said it's like well this won the award this won the award but if you want to watch something we always made that list it's like don't don't skip this one over because it's yeah. really really yeah. interesting what bucking the odds and then of course being purchased by amazon and itunes and youtube and then finally netflix uh we went we were defying the odds in so many different ways that uh, at this point it's this thing is running on autopilot so you don't a board of directors it's probably never going to happen i mean it's it we're not exactly it's it's not like Occupy Wall Street where there was no leadership at all. Of course there's leadership, but it's, again, it's built on content. It's loosely based on content. So yeah, yeah. like D Marble, he's up in the Seattle area. I've run into him, I think like five different meetups at least. Yeah. Bob from Globusters, run into him before. I've talked to Jaron, I've talked to Rob, I've talked to Robbie and, and everybody at the conference and everybody that was in the, the documentary. Um, we all know each other. But at the same time, there's not really any jealousy or rivalry because there is no board of directors. You know, yeah. there's no rules. So everyone's just kind of doing their own thing. And we're kind of yes. like, oh, you're doing that? Oh, that's cool. We're doing this over here. It kind of reminds me, last part on this, uh, it kind of reminds me of the old days of Silicon Valley. Yes. Where all the old, the, the original programmers like Wozniak and Jobs and Gates and, oh, I don't know, Nolan Bushnell. In fact, there's a great story. Uh, let me tell you real quick, which was like back w back in the day when, when um, like Wa Jobs and Wozniak, the, in, they knew Nolan Bushnell. This was back when nobody knew anything about computers. They were just winging it. They knew it was wide open and they was like, what, what do we do? Let's just go do, do stuff. And um, the... Uh, Jobs and Wozniak went over to Nolan Bushnell and he, he goes, what are you working on? He goes, oh, I'm working on this thing, hooks up to a television, I think play games, yeah. right? And they go, yeah. what, what are you working on? It's like, well, it's like a console with its own built-in TV thing. And and they're both like, oh yeah, well, you know, you know, neither side wanted to give up their own projects. Yeah. And so Jobs and Wozniak went over and formed Apple and then Nolan Bushnell formed Atari and eventually sold it for a huge amount of money. And but the point was is that everybody was doing their own thing and it all helped the industry. So that's what we're kind of doing, which is everybody's doing their own thing. It's all helping Flat Earth. But and yeah. we've got loose ties. And, you know, again, we I, I could talk to any of these guys right now. But we all know that, that the future is so wide open that we're just kind of going forward. It's, again, the it's the, the clans of the Scottish Highlands. You know, running yes. downfield, everyone's got their own flags. We've all got the same common opponent. 
Uh, but nobody's, you know, allegiances are, are loose at best. And so a, a board of directors, I think, would just hurt us. Uh, I don't think there would be anything that uh, it would benefit us. Because once you start getting into rules, and that kind of feels, I hate to use, use this term, it kind of feels like marriage. I've seen too many couples yeah. is like everything was great until they got married. And I heard the same thing over and over where it was like, yeah, we were in a room just having fun. And then we got married and the door locked. Yes. And then it's like, <laughs> ah, then they, I mean, even yes. though the same people, same room, now you feel that the, the, it's changed, you know, the, the perspective has changed. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll just and have you to know, see, but in, go ahead. in your, in your interviews, you always, you always say that everything came unsolicited, like the books and the documentary yeah. and, yeah. um, and, uh, I always found your exposure story really interesting. How, uh, a lot of uh, media outlets or individuals would reach out to you to try to get to bat power land. Yeah. But it got to the point where he, he was on a, he was on a pedestal and he wasn't willing to get down from the pedestal or from the throne. Yeah. He wasn't and, willing to talk. and there was a very limited window there. And that's what he didn't realize. And that is when yeah. it comes to stuff and especially nowadays with social media, you got a window of opportunity yeah. and he did not take it deliberately. It was like, oh, no, that window will stay open for me. It's like, no, 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 yeah. it won't stay open for you because the media is lazy. The media wants to interview people and they want to interview them now. And all of a sudden, you know, if again, all I had to do was get a few under my belt and that was it. And then then we were off to the races because everybody else, it's like, well, does he give a good, decent enough interview? Because that's all producers care about. It's like a producer's job is really, really busy. And it's really precarious. So all if they watch, you know, listen to an interview I do, and they listen to five, ten minutes and go, yeah, he'll be fine. Call him. And that's it. And then it was like Matt who after a while where and then he changed his name. That did not help. Yeah. Uh, so and then he became the antagonist in the film, uh, which I thought was hilarious because. Yes. Nobody, and... no, none of the scientists would step up and be the villain. Everybody was smiling for the camera. The only yeah. guy that wasn't smiling was Matt. So. Yeah. And uh, I, I understand that, Patricia, that you you um, and I agree with you when you look at the I remember when you and uh, Patricia Steer started to kind of discuss the documentary, you were more optimistic. Yeah. You said that, yes, at, the, at, at sometimes it, it made us look funny and it made us look weird. But at the end of the day, it's exposure. They, they know who I am. They reach out to me through this. And, you know, Patricia Steer was more like I didn't like how the storyline was. But to me, honestly, Mark. And, and and this may seem weird, but as much as I do know about Flat Earth yeah. and as much as I understand about the concepts, I think the best thing they could have done is what they did in documentary I because do it it feels light and it feels playful and it feels it feels like a great introductory, to be honest. Absolutely. I went to enough festival showings in the crowd where they did not obviously didn't know who I was. And the what, what the hook was that the first 20, 30 minutes the people in the audience and the people watching on Netflix didn't know it was real. And yes. so for the first, I mean, they're watching this kind of laughing going, Oh, well, it's a mockumentary. It's a piece of docufiction. And then all of a sudden you could, you could, you could see it in their head. It was, it was too much. We were, the, we were playing it straight for too long. And all of a sudden people were like going, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is, this is actually a thing that's happening on the internet, like for real for right now. And yeah. uh, when, that at that point they were already in too far it's like well i gotta watch it, it, then it became this mind-blowing experience for them to where even though they didn't believe it they were like wait there's this is really a thing and then they were engaged yeah. for the rest of the the movie and by the time the 100 minutes ran i mean i i'm telling you i was there i mean yes patricia wanted it to be a, a pristine perfect sterilized type of yeah. propaganda film which is fine but we're, we're not in germany in the 1940s so yeah. when I went up on stage and was talking to these people, I mean, they would, and I remember there was one out and I think it was in your neck of the woods. Um, it was in, um, oh, hot springs. Yeah. And, uh, they literally, nobody left the, the one, everyone just had their hands up. It's like questions. It's like everybody had questions and that's where we got, you know, it became the biggest Trojan horse recruiting tool we ever could have gotten. So yes, you're absolutely right. I wouldn't have changed a thing thing because even at the end even the shot it took it they took it jaron generated headlines and generated yes. interest yeah jaron had to take some some hits for it um same thing with bob 
they took the hit they took they took the shots where they could but in the end the director and i don't think they even deliberately i think it was you know the combination of the director and the editor i don't think even they knew what sort of impact it was going to have out there yeah uh so no i i wouldn't have made it and it also helped us inadvertently uh that the everybody involved in that film were not flat earthers meaning because when the director went up on stage and i watched it happen the first question first question always was are you flat earthers and mm. they always said no we're not we just wanted to cover this had they said yes the audience would have turned on them because yeah. they would have been like well then it's a propaganda piece and we can't take you seriously but because they were against flat earth they you know but not in a super mean way the the audience was like okay let's talk about this yeah so yeah and I agree. and going back to that whole bob and jaron thing uh Honestly, when I saw the documentary, uh, because the last part ends off of uh, Jaren saying that that's interesting right. uh, after doing the experiment, but um, I think I think the mistake was the editing because I I, I listened to Bob and Jaren's response and they said that the the producer felt like more of a friend than anything because he was you invited and he right. and you and what you said was very true. I felt like when that kid stood up and when he asked about flat earth then the director was like okay now it's like game on time yeah, we have yeah. To shut now it's, it's down too now. real yeah and as the saying goes shit, shit just got real that that yeah. is very very true and i saw that in different interviews not just him but other podcasts and even logan paul said it you know and yeah. even without seeing the documentary he he was right. like talking about you know this girl this 14 year old girl that was at the conference and, and he was saying wow you're too young to be in flat earth it's like where does he come off asking that so yeah exactly. yeah it was uh again it, it everything helped us in the end it didn't feel like yes. that to the flyers community and everything i predicted came true which was the community just railed against it uh but everybody outside the community are like yeah you gotta see this I mean, I including friends that I hadn't talked to in decades call, calling me up. So, all right, Mark, I got, I honestly, I've got more than enough to work with, okay. and I've got a lot of, a lot of great sound bites. I want to take just five minutes sure. uh, of your time sure. to, um, to just tell you uh, a few things, um, just a few bit of information. Uh, I'd like I said, I've watched hundreds of your videos, and. Um, uh, one of them that uh, stood out to me uh, and um, hit a bit personally was the aerospace navigator that you had on the show. Yeah. And uh, it, it was very informative, but some of the segments, um, some of the segments he was a bit, um, he was a bit critical to the aspect. And, uh, you know, he said that, um, you know, Islam is a certain way or pictured or framed a certain direction. Sure. And I want to preface to you, because here I work with a lot of churches around my community that, uh, you know, out of the 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, uh, uh, ISIS and Daesh only account for 100,000, which is 0.0001%. Right. And um, yeah, I just wanted to preface that. Uh, I, I, I Like I said, I want to say I love your work. I think what you're doing is amazing, honestly. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't even mind calling myself a flat earther. Uh, I'm awfully distracted by, by studies and by trying to sure. get into medical school sure. and become a surgeon. But like I said, I'm a huge fan and I want to thank you so much for this interview. Oh, and uh, thank you so much. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the Shire because that's where I will be going uh, in a few weeks. So oh, I'm you're, going? To you're going to Hobbiton? Yes. Oh, yes. you are uh, so lucky. Yeah, and, and I was happy because I saw your uh, re reaction and how you talked about it and the culture there. So yeah. I'm excited to cross-reference. Yeah, it's a but like I said, a, well, amazing place and you'll have so much fun. Yes, and thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. This I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send you an email and uh, okay. I'll tell you about the reactions and, and, and the responses I get from, okay. this, um, from this project. Do you, want the, do you want the audio for this or do you already have it? That would be amazing. Mark. I will I will drop it in in Skype the second we're done. All right. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Okay, Thank you, you so too. much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.